From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We are at our Palo Alto studios today, and as we continue to go through week after week after week of the COVID crisis, the COVID situation, you know, we've been focusing on leadership, and we've been reaching out to the community to get their take on, you know, what's happening, best practices, things that they can share to help uh, and to share knowledge with with the rest of the community. And we're really excited to have our next guest, Rebecca Knight. You know her as a guest host on the Cube. She's actually been a freelance journalist for decades. Uh, and writes for all the top pubs. That's how we met her in the first uh, first place, doing some work at MIT. So Rebecca, first off, great to see you. It's been too long. We were supposed to be together this week, uh, but situation uh, kind of changed the schedule a little bit. Indeed, it's so it's so good to see your face, Jeff, and it's so fun to be working with the Cube gang again. Even though we are we are many miles apart right now, we should all be together. Um, but but it, I'm really happy to be here. Happy to be talking to you. Great. Well, I am too. And let's let's jump into it because you know you've been writing about leadership, but really why I wanted to reach out with you is instead of you kind of co-hosting our guests, really get get your perspective on things because you've been writing about leadership for a very long time. So now that we're I don't know six weeks into this thing, um, what are you writing about? What you know has has the the topics kind of shifted? You know, over the last several weeks, what's kind of top of mind? What are you uh, publishing this week? Absolutely, the topics have shifted in the sense that there is only one topic, and that is COVID-19, and that is how are managers coping with this with this health crisis, this pandemic that is uh, all over the world, of course, and a huge part of our workplace right now. Uh, managers are just dealing with this unprecedented event in history and trying to be a sense of strength for their colleagues and for their direct reports um, at a time where they themselves don't really know what the future holds. None of us know what the future holds. And so this is a very hard time for managers right now. And so that's, that's a lot of what I'm doing um, for, Har for Harvard Business Review. You know, there's so many pieces to that. One, you know, we've been talking a lot about it as being kind of this light switch digital transformation moment, because even if you had planned and people have been planning and things have been slowly moving, whether it be working from home for jobs or remote uh, education and higher education, or a, a lot of these things, they were kind of, you know, moving along and all of a sudden, boom, full stop, ready, set, go. Everyone has to stay home. So th there wasn't really a, a plan, a rollout plan, and it's quite a challenge. And the other thing is not only for you, the individual who's going through this, but their significant other or spouse is also home, the kids are also home. And, and again, nobody really got an opportunity to plan uh, and, and to try to think some of these things through. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's not only just work from, from home, but now it's this pandemic that adds all these extra layers uh, of complexity and to, you, to your point, uncertainty, which is always the hardest thing to deal with. You know, Jeff, I've actually been working from home for over a decade now. I worked for the Financial Times for about for 10 years and, that, and even and then I was Boston correspondent for the FT working from home. Um, I was following a bunch of writers on Twitter. People were writing and saying, working from home is the worst. I'm, I'm constantly at least snapping, I can't concentrate. This, I will never want to work from home. And then all these writers were chiming in saying, hold up, there's working from home and then there's working from home during a global pandemic. Two totally different things. Um, but you're absolutely right. This is a time where our families are underfoot. We're trying to homeschool our children. We are quarantined with our spouse, trying to make our marriages work, and also trying to do the job that we're being paid to do if we're lucky enough to still be employed or still have assignments um, in the hopper. So you're right, this is, this is a very, this is not necessarily the test of remote work and remote learning that I think we all deserve and we will someday have. And we were, we're showing this is obviously an experiment and in some ways it's showing that it can work um, in different ways, but there is also, this is, this isn't exact, this is more, oh, we, hey, you have uh, eight days to get all your employees online right now, or eight days to roll out your curriculum. So this is not quite exactly what we had all had in mind when we're talking about the future of online education or the digital organization, but 
but it, it's certainly interesting to watch it all happen. So it's funny, as part of this, we had Martin Mikos on, and he has been running distributed teams for decades. And it was really funny, his take on it, which was that it's so much easier to fake it at the office, right? And, 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 and too many people, we had um, uh, Amy Hayworth on from Citrix, and in, in a blog that she referenced, you know, eventually people will start judging people based on outcome versus behavior and act activities, and it just, it strikes me that um, in 2020, you know, is this what it's taken to get people to actually judge people by their output? And I think you know Martin's other take was that when you work from home, all you have is your output. You know, you don't have kind of looking busy or saying hi to the boss or the car looks really great today. You know, you only have your output. And his take was it's actually a much easier way to decide who's doing the job and who's not doing the job. Yeah, you know, I'm of two minds with that because I think that there is so much to be said for the teamwork. There's so, I mean, you may not be the person who is definitely always pedal to the metal, um, getting every single thing done, checking all the boxes, you, you know, I mean, obviously you have to be sort of have a baseline of productivity and engagement, but there's also just, you're someone that other people like to work with. You're someone who offers good ideas, who who can be a really good sounding board, who just will have those moments of creativity that are really important for a team to to be to succeed and to and to get to the finish line. And, and again, I'm not saying the people who are just have just been coasting. Oh yeah, this is it for you. But I'm just saying that there's a lot of different personalities and a lot of skill sets that go into making a great high functioning team. It takes all types. Um, and so, and so, I think that we are missing that. We are missing the camaraderie, the collegiality of the water cooler chat, and and that's where teams do a lot of problem solving. Um, is is sort of that informal conversation that right now a lot of us are missing because we've all had way too much Zoom, and no one wants to just sort of shoot the breeze on Zoom with anyone. So what? So what are you telling people? So unfortunately, you know, this is not how we would have planned it, and we would have probably transitioned it in, in a little bit smoother manner. But here we are, and we're actually now five, six weeks into it. And the, I think the the Monday was, I think March sixteenth was the big day here in the Bay Area when it all kind of got got official. So what are some things that you're sharing with with leaders and managers? You know, some specific things they can do, some specific tasks that they can do to help get through this better. The first thing I would say, and, and this is what I'm hearing from the experts that I'm talking to, the people who really study crisis management, is first of all, steal yourself. This is this is a challenge of a lifetime, and you are leading through something that is hard, and you need to understand that. And and first of all, uh, don't be too hard on yourself because this is this is this is really difficult. This is what they're going to be writing case studies about in business schools for decades for to come. Um, so th these are really big management challenges. Steal yourself, be ready for the challenge. Um, make sure you are taking care of yourself, getting enough sleep, getting rest on the weekend, time with your family and friends, do exercise, eat right. Don't just snack on Cheetos all day long. Um, make sure you are taking care of yourself. Uh, in terms of interacting with your employees and your team, obviously, like I, I just said, everyone, everyone cannot Everyone's Zoom fatigue is real. Um, but at the same time, you do need to make time to talk to your team and say, hey, how are you? How are things? Make sure that people are doing okay. You need to make sure that you have your your finger on the pulse of your team and make sure everyone's mental health is, is a-okay. Uh, so yeah, empathy, humility, share with your team problems that you're that you're facing yourself. I mean, obviously they should not be the repository for all of your fears and insecurities and worries about, whoa, I don't know if I, I gotta, I don't am I gonna have a job next week? But um, but at the same time, talk about the challenges you're facing too. Your team needs to know that you aren't a uh, superhuman. You know, you you're a human too. You're going through this just like they are. Right. That's what's such a weird thing about it too, you know, having been through a couple of events like the earthquake or Mount St. Helens blowing up, you know, the, the people that were in that area when something like that goes down have a common story, right? Where were you in the earthquake? Where were you when Mount St. Helens blew up? But now this is a global thing where everyone will have a story. Where were you in March, 2020? So the fact that we're all going through it together and there's so many stories and impacts, you know, the more people you talk to, you know, the layers of the onions just keep unpeeling. 
uh, to more and more and more impact. But I'm curious to get your take on kind of how you see once we do get out of this, because whether it's 12 months or 18 months or 24 months to get to a vaccine, you know, now it seems like forever in the grand scheme of things, it's going to be a relatively short period of window. But, but over that time, you know, behaviors become habits. And I'm just curious to get your take as to when it's okay to go back to work, whenever that is. I don't see it going back the way that it was, because who's going to want to sit on Highway 101 for two hours every morning once you've figured out a pretty good routine and a pretty good workflow uh, without doing that? How do you see it kind of shaking out? So I couldn't agree more. And this is, and I, like I said, I've worked from home for many, many years. And so I do think that people, this is dispelling the myth that you need to work where you live. You have a lot more agency and a lot more freedom to get your job done anywhere you want to live. And if that's in a city, because I mean, God willing, sports will come back and theater will come back, music and all the reasons we love living in cities, uh, we will one day be able to do that again. But if you like living near the mountains or near the ocean, uh, you, you can do that and get your job done. So I think we're, I think you're, you're absolutely right about that. We're going to see many more people making a decision about, you know, this is the life I want to live and I can still my, do my job. And yet, people still like being around other people. I mean, I think that's why we're all going a little stir crazy right now is because we, we just, we miss other people, we miss interacting. And so I think that the, we will have to think about some ways to create different kinds of offices um, and perhaps we work type things, but I, I think they could just be different offices all over and they could be in the suburbs, they could be in the mountains and it could just be a place where people come together and sometimes they're in the same, uh, industry field, sometimes maybe in the same company. Uh, but I think that they don't even necessarily need to be that way. I think that some people will, will want to work from home and I think other people will want to go someplace, even if it's not uh, what we think of as the typical American office. Right. right. But I even think, and, and I used to think this before, right? As you know, I ride my bikes and do all my little e-toys, but you know, even if people didn't commute one day a week or didn't commute one day every two weeks or two days a week, you know, the impact on the infrastructure, to me, some of these second order effects is, you know, looking at empty freeways and, and empty streets demonstrate that we actually have a lot of infrastructure. It just gets overwhelmed when everybody's on it at the same time. So just the whole concept of going in the same time every day, of course, if you're in construction or you're in trades and you got a truck full of gear that you have to take, that's one thing. But for so many people now that are information workers and are just working on a laptop, whether it be home at a WeWork or, or at the office, you know, even shifting a couple of days a week, I think has just a huge impact on infrastructure, quality of life, you know, the environment in terms of pollution, uh, gas consumption and on and on and on. So we, I don't think it will go 100% one way or the other, but I certainly don't think it'll go 100% back to, you know, going into the office every day from eight to five. I, I couldn't agree more. And just the, the idea of the quality of life, and you know, I'm, I have two children, nine and 12, and they're doing their schoolwork from home and they're, they're doing all right. They're hanging in. My, my older one in particular, I say that she's sort of this mix between a graduate student and a young MBA because she's got her little devices already zooming with her science teacher. Then she's got play rehearsal there. But, but um, you know, I, I think that the, the slowing down has actually been kind of good for them too, because they're busy kids and they have a lot going on and actually having family dinners, having board games, watching family movies, uh, going for family hikes on the weekends. That has been really good good and for, for every I mean, obviously we're all so indebted and grateful to the frontline workers. Um, and, and we, we also see there is a lot of loss around us, people losing loved ones to this horrible disease and then losing livelihoods. Um, but I think that then that we are seeing a few silver linings in this too. So I think that some, sometimes our quality of life has, for some people, this has been, um, this quarantine's getting a little old, but at the same time, I think that there has been some bright spot for a lot of, for a lot of people too. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And again, it's a, a horrible human toll, um, people getting sick and dying and, and, and the economic toll is gargantuan, um, especially for people with no safety net and are in industries that just don't exist in, right now, like uh, travel and leisure. Um, and, 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 and things that are in the business of bringing people together when you can't bring people together. But just final question before I let you go is, is really on higher education. So it's one thing with the kids and, 
and, and, and K through 12 and, and you know, how sophisticated they are and ability to learn online. But I'm, I'm really more interested to get your take on higher education because you know, you've already got kind of the scale back in terms of the number of physical classes that people attend when they're in, when they're in undergrad and the actual amount of time that they spend you know, in, uh, in lecture. I mean, this is just now knocking that right off of the table. Um, and I'm just really curious to get your take on higher education with distributed learning, because it's, it's something that's been talked about for a long time. Um, I think there's been a lot of resistance, but again, this light switch moment, and if it goes on for into the next uh, school year, what's, what, what's that gonna do to, uh, to kind of higher education and the stance of, of how much infrastructure they actually need to support educating uh, these kids? Well, I am a Wesleyan grad and uh, the president of Wesleyan was quoted in the New York Times this weekend talking about that, this very topic saying that this has really shown us the value of a residential for, not necessarily four year, but residential education where people are together and they are able to collaborate, be creative, have fierce debate in the classroom uh, that is just frankly not possible uh, with remote learning or at least not to the same degree, to the same extent. Um, and, and the kind of uh, accessibility you have with professors, particularly at a small liberal arts school like the one that I went to. I think that, Jeff, a lot of, a lot of colleges are not going to be able to survive this because they're just, they are so de tuition dependent. And a lot of kids uh, are going to defer. If they, if they say, you know, if I can't be at college in the fall, I'm going to take a year off and go to community college, or I'm going to you know, do something else, take a gap here, and then re reassess my options once this uh, health crisis passes. And I think that for a lot of colleges, that's just that's just not uh, not tenable for them and for their uh, for their operations. So I'm afraid that a lot of businesses, a lot of colleges, are going to close. Yeah, it's just um, it's just crazy the the impact and, and and just showing you know as you said, we are social beings. We like to be together and. And when you, when you stop people from being together, it makes you really realize how often we are together, whether it's uh, you know, weddings and funerals and, and bar mitzvahs and, and those kind of things in church and family stuff, or whether it's business things, conventions, concerts, sporting events. I mean, so many things, street fairs, you know, are really about bringing people together and we do like to be together. So um, this too will pass and, and, and hopefully, you know, the, the warriors in this battle thankfully are, are super smart. Um, you know, we're hopefully using a lot of uh, modern compute that we didn't have in the past. Thankfully we have things like, like the internet and Zoom that you and I can talk from 3000 miles away. So uh, I'm glad you're hopeful, I'm hopeful we'll get through it. And, uh, and then we can get together on a set and do some interviews together. I can't right, wait. Right, exactly, <laughs> I miss you, yes, absolutely. All right, Rebecca, well, thanks for checking in. Be safe, look forward to seeing you in person, and, uh, and until then, uh, have a great, I guess, May. We're into May, Mother's Day coming up, so uh, happy Mother's Day a few days early. Thank you very much, Jeff. It was a pleasure working with you again. All right, well, take care. She's Rebecca, I'm Jeff. You are watching theCUBE. Thanks for checking in. We'll see you next time. Thank you.